Welcome to Get the Net, a fishing podcast that takes a deep dive into competitive events, fishing news, tips, tactics, and most importantly, interviews with some of the most interesting and in-tuned anglers from Canada to the central U.S. We're leaving no stone unturned to bring you the most raw and authentic talk talk. My name is Jamie Bruce, and while my resume says bass, my frying pan says walleye, I'm no stranger to the multi-species realm. Whether you're puttering on tackle, driving the bus, cutting the grass, or killing time in a 9 to 5, I'll try to give you something in every episode to take with you on the water, or at the very least, bring you a few laughs. What's going on, man? Hey. Is it <laughs> audio all right, or is it all echoey? No, uh, you're not bad. We'll right. tune her up after. Perfect. Send it into the lab. <laughs> What's going How's on, man? Going? Oh, not much, bud. Just pottering around a little bit. Looks like you're doing the same. Yep, yep. There's always something. There's always something to fix, right? You got to get going, or you got some time? I got time. I'm good. Okay. I'll duck out any time. Yeah. No, I'm, so, I I got everything done. I needed to get done for now, at least. So. All right, beauty, bud. Well, hey. Usually on these, I'll like you know talk through uh, you know like local stuff and tournaments and whatever and i'll talk by myself for like 20 minutes but um we'll probably just go through that with you while i've got you here cool if that works i uh went out dancing last night so i got the sunday scaries a little bit i don't feel like talking to a computer by myself in the garage so (laughs) yeah i get that (laughs) maybe you can help us along a little bit here so uh yeah, we'll we'll get into to your story in a minute here. We'll just go over a couple uh a couple local deals here quick. Um first one I'm sure you see you're you know, you're seeing the high water right now. Man, it's uh, crazy. Yeah, they say it capped twenty fourteen levels and it's like half a foot away from the record right now. And it really uh you can really see the effects down on the south shore here. I'm I'm uh down on the Rainy River right now and at the angle too, you know, it's such gradual shorelines and man, it's uh huge changes. Like big distance, uh I mean of course it's all just shallow water, but stuff that's been really high and dry the last few years, so it's it's yeah, it's nuts. Yeah, and you guys have the mega waves on that part of the lake too, that south part, so I'm sure some of those waves are going halfway through some of those big islands. Yeah, I think Pine Island's about ready to disappear. I mean, it's going to wash away. Last time the water was this high, it um, it changed a lot on kind of the, it'd be the west end of Pine Island, like Morris Point, Bostic Creek. There used to be just a, uh, you know, probably a half mile gap. And I guess it really washed away, it would have been like 2002, we had had a crazy high water year and um you know uh the whole end of that island was big pines and and they all floated away and it's all just a couple feet deep now well normally a couple feet deep now it's about six but um but yeah you know that sand and then at the angle it's all just swamp bog that's all washing away people's shorelines are they're still paying property taxes on stuff that's in the lake now so it's crazy yeah Yeah. oh it's unreal so uh, there's a bunch of carnage uh there's you know some tournaments are getting canceled on this end which is really is not it kind of pales in comparison to the damage being done but uh they were supposed to have one on falcon lake this past weekend here in uh in manitoba bass derby they've got a different season so they can run run tournaments there earlier and they uh they were getting a lot of flack there's a bunch of cottages on the lake so she got canceled so well, even the landings, even the landings are tough to use. You know, yeah. I got to walk through like 50 feet of water just to get to the dock. So it's, uh, yeah, I can, I guess I can see, you know, the fish are still there, but then you got this weird late ice out too. Water temps are cool. Um, you know, the last few days I was catching bass in like 30, 35 feet. They haven't even come close to pulling up yet. So yeah, they're taking their time. Hey yeah and then that happens a lot at that tournament uh the last couple times we won her was down super deep and you had to fizz them you know i didn't even want to go to the lakes the the lake trout lakes that we normally would hit just because it wasn't even close to that you know late season bite yet mm-hmm. um we ended up going to uh 
to um, what is it, Porcupine Provincial Park or Porcupine Mountain Provincial Park. There's Steep Rock or North Steep Rock Lake, and um, you start going up the hill, and there was like eight feet of snow when we got there. I couldn't believe it. It was we stayed until uh, the end of the first week of May, and it seemed like it was going to be months before the snow melted and the ice ice got out of there. I mean, it was just crazy. Yeah, they're still dealing with it up in some of those areas in Manitoba. Man, it's going to be... I thought that the ice was going to be, you know, just leaving the trout waters in this area, like, around this time, but I think all the rain kind of accelerated everything, so... Yeah, the current jacked it up like crazy, and, you know... Oh, there's a lot, but... Yeah, anyway, don't want to throw a bunch of shade at Manitoba, but that's, uh, you know, after looking at the regs, that's kind of crazy, so... Had to yeah. touch on it a little bit there. Yeah, one thing we got to touch on because we're it's a fishing podcast. Uh, Ray Scott died a couple weeks ago from Bassmaster. Um, for those of you that don't know, he's like pretty much the grandfather of tournament fishing. Um, you know, really invented like the you know the way bass tournaments are today and and the classic and and uh you know conservation and and all that stuff surrounding bass fishing all the stuff we all love right now so it's been a bunch of talk in, down south about about him and and i actually um watched a video of a bass tournament in soon arrows and he had hosted it there like oh, cool it was like 40 years ago i'll i'll link it here because it's an unreal watch but there were all these boys from all over all over the south they're hawking spinner baits. It didn't matter if they're small mouth, large mouth fishing, clear water, dirty water. Every single person was just whipping a spinner bait. It's <laughs> super cool. They had a bunch of footage. They were up in planes and and it was wicked. But there was a part in there that you won't like though. There's a, a guy toiled with a big muskie. <laughs> <laughs> it was a kid from like Illinois or something, and he brought her up to the weigh in. Like with his bass. No way. Yeah. So, I mean, you, I don't want to ruin the video, but uh, yeah, he's like, yeah, it came up to the side of the boat and I beat it over the head with my net and put it in my <laughs> rod locker. He put it in his rod locker at 10 o'clock and pulled it out at weigh in and Jeez. dragged it up over his shoulder. It's an unreal watch. You got to see it. You won't like that part, but. Well, it wasn't that long ago, you know, like I fish with a lot of guys that have places around the angle and they never used any nets. They don't, they hate to see me pull out my net, you know, uh, it's things really changed with, uh, with the way musky fishermen handle muskies just in the last, I don't know, like even just the last 15 years that, and really, I think it's the equipment too, like the big nets and everything, but you know, they, uh, Sorry, I got some guys working here. Ah, oh, it's good. It's good. Sharpening skates. Sharpening skates, yeah. <laughs> Gordon Bombay's in the background. <laughs> coming up the knife. Uh, but yeah, you know, and it's it's just crazy to to even just the other day, I, my my buddies got some videos from when around the angle, and and they had the big, you know with the VHS and the camera right on it, they'd bring it out there with them and uh, they're just playing it out, playing it out. And my favorite part is he's like, Oh, what's that? 53, 54. And they hoist it out of the water and just lay it on the floor on top of a tape measure. And then, of course it's only like 48, but that's kind of where I think you get a lot of the old timers talking about big fish. They're like, just eyeballing them, you know, and they, nobody used a bump board or anything, but they're, you know, they're hardy fish at times, but man, I've, I've had a couple go belly up that just, I mean, by the time you get them to the, to the boat, just from the fight, you know, they choke a, you know, take a lure deep or something. And it's like, if you don't want to hurt the fish, probably shouldn't even be using hooks, I guess, because. Yeah. You, you can just cut them off and go on a sightseeing tour. <laughs> That's how it was when I used to have to guide for muskie. Anyway, we'd just go look at follows and never catch any. So I was doing my part for <laughs> muskie conservation. <laughs> When did people start being nice to muskies? Well, yeah, I mean, it's, I don't know what, uh, it must have been Pete Mania preaching it so hard. Yeah. (laughs) Is that that when the cradle started coming out? Remember that old thing? Oh, man. Yeah. Like, I, I, when I first started muskie fishing, I didn't really know, you know, I, I uh, thought that the cradle was the thing. I had seen videos where guys are using cradles. And so I hop in the boat with, 
some friends of mine, or actually they hopped in with me and I, I pull the cradle out and they're like, what are you doing? You know, but I just, uh, like I said, I, I didn't even look into it or anything. And I was like, what, you guys don't have a cradle? And they're like, no, well, okay, well, I guess I'll get rid of that. But Were they it's kind of a gimmick, like one, one guy on tv back in the day said these are the deal and that's what everyone <laughs> ran out and got or what like why did everyone used to have them and now no one does it looked like a nightmare trying to cradle one but oh hooks in the face and <laughs> i actually have one for that musky tournament over in nestor falls in the fall uh you know we got to do the measurements in the water and the cradle right. works really well for that but other than that you know the thing sits on a shelf in the top of the dock house and I just try not to lose it from one year to the next. <laughs> <laughs> well, we got a bunch of bunch of talking to get into here. Uh, I'll just get a little bit more of the stuff out of the way. Talked about so on the on the last show, Canbat lithium batteries. Just got my new Pro V bass showed up this week. Loaded her up with can bath. I got the Bluetooth ones this time. I can see what's going on. I'm sure a musky fisherman like yourself can appreciate good batteries. Uh, oh yeah, you know, super light, last all day. And, uh, yeah, I mean, they're, they're a spendy hit up front, but they're worth it in the end. So if you want to save a few bucks on them, type in Bruce five at canbat.com, save you a few bucks there. And then, uh, yeah, BT fishing promo code, get the net, uh, save you another 10%. Again, lots of people were using that the last couple of weeks. Um, you know, lately on the bass front, the clean jig is going to be real real dialed in this year with the high water it's just a swim jig with a texas rig swim bait you can fire around in the bush and deadly on the bass front and then just the end jig and uh and a ned rig it's our version of a ned head um you know been hammering them it's got a cool design it definitely catches them so check that out btfishing.com promo code get the net all right, bud, I got that out of the way. We, uh, we got to dive deep on you. I'm excited to talk to you. The first few uh, guests that we've had have been like tournament guys, um, you know, and, and I know you fish tournaments, but you uh, you spend more time on, on the guide train and just doing wild stuff, it seems like. <laughs> I, I, I mean, I don't know you real well, but from where I'm standing, you seem like pretty damn hardcore angler so what's uh what's your story bud well um i grew up right on the rainy river my parents ran a float plane service um uh out of the rainy river there so i got to experience um the lake uh, and and all over northwest ontario from the plane you know and and at that time i wasn't crazy into fishing or anything i was pretty young but i got to go out to some unbelievable locations fly in lakes and and but I think really just seeing everything from the air, Lake of the Woods, and and everything that surrounds it, just made me fall in love with it. It's um, it's where I've been my whole life, and and I just, uh, you know, I guess I kind of always wanted to guide, but I guess I didn't really picture myself doing it right off the right out of school or whatever. I kind of figured I should, I, I, well, I knew I should probably get a real job first and try and make some money before I got into guiding. And, and I guess, um, when I was trying to get a real job was kind of that recession time. And, yes. and I was, you know, kind of just looked at guiding like, well, you know, I'll do it for a few years here. And I was just working around the resorts on the docks and, and just everything. And, um, you know, they stuck me in a boat and, uh, I just really enjoy getting out there and taking people fishing, you know, and um, I enjoy the history of the lake and, and learning something every day you go out and, um, and I, I just, you know, I have a tough time not being out there. I spend a lot of time. I don't know how many days a year I spend on Lake of the Woods, but it's got to be like 300 plus or something between the, the summer and winter and, um, yeah, the, uh, number, <laughs> the number's crazy. And this is the only place you can you can do that, you know, fish it almost every day and still still look forward to going around the next corner because you can, you know, there's still lots of stuff you can't, like no one can fish in a lifetime. Oh, not even close. And you and like I said, you're learning something every day you go out. You, whether, you know, with guiding, it, it might be learning how to deal with people or or the fishing side of it. I mean, there's just... 
with guiding, if you're not learning something every day, you're probably not doing it right or you're just not into it, I guess. And I know a lot of guides, uh, there's, you know, throughout Minnesota, there's like five guides on every block and uh, they fish the same lakes and a lot of guys get burnt out because uh, you're just going to the same spots and, and that doesn't happen on Lake of the Woods. You know, it's the top of the mountain, of course. And, and so I'm lucky to be able to just want to learn something when I go out and the angles, uh, an awesome place because it's not really commercialized or widely advertised. So we get a lot of clientele that are experienced anglers. They probably hired guides and, and own their own boats and stuff. I, I rarely yeah. even have to provide gear for the clients, which is, I think pretty rare as far as guiding goes. And so when you have people that are into fishing and everything, uh, like I am, then, um, it just, it, I don't know, it makes it easy and, and they enjoy learning stuff with me. And, and, um, I don't know. I just, yeah, the guiding thing just kind of fell into place and it's working out pretty good. Of course, um, the last few years here have been kind of rough, uh, at the angle with the border yes. closure and everything, but, yeah. Um, and I mean, for those of, uh, you know, whoever's listening that, um, may not know where the Northwest angle is. It's a real weird place. Uh, it, it's in the U.S. Uh, it's surrounded by Canada, and it's like on the border of the U.S., Canada, on Lake of the Woods. I don't know what what happened there, but there's a little piece of Minnesota in the in the middle of Lake of the Woods, and um, you, they had you, it all. They had it all messed up. You know, they had uh, the the map of the lake at the time when they were drawing the border. It was oval shaped with like nine islands on it, and um, and they kind of had the oval going like at southeast to northwest. And so they, they want, and then they were screwed up. They thought that the headwaters of the Mississippi River were at the northwest side of Lake of the Woods. And so they decided that the border would go across Lake of the Woods at a northwest angle to the headwaters of the Mississippi. Well, um, you know, they, they actually uh, thought that Portage Bay was was the northwest corner of the lake there's still a monument in the in the west end of portage where um they they had put up a, a um a marker to where they thought that that well and then they they realized that wasn't the right spot so they went down monument bay there's also another um marker on the west end and then they went one more bay down they decided that the Northwest angle inlet there was, was the Northwest corner of the lake. And then they yeah. just left it that way. And when they realized there was a mistake, they said they'd just drop it down to the 49th parallel from that, what they thought was the Northwest corner of the lake. And then, you know, they, they just left it that way. And so the only way you can stay in the U S to get to the Northwest angle is to cross big Traverse Bay Otherwise, to uh, travel up by land, you got to go through Manitoba for, for um, I suppose, like 30 miles. And then you, you cross back into the U.S. on a gravel road. There's no, there's no border station. Um, actually, the, the actual border cut has nothing at all. It's wide open, and it's, it, it's just a, it's a awesome spot. And we're lucky that we get to use it. Um, yeah. Yeah. No. And, and, you know, I was kind of chirping that the, you know, obviously like it would be an insane thing to try to map out this lake back in the day. And now yeah. we just pull up a map and say, Oh, look at, you know, simple, but like, I couldn't imagine they probably had like brutal boats uh, oh, you know, trying to figure out across big Travers. I'd just be like, ah, whatever, this is close enough. We'll just, you know, no one's going to know. <laughs> it's crazy no but yeah it must have been a crazy crazy time well so. and i just i can only imagine what they were going through to try and find you know try and make a map of, of the border like that they yeah so but it's it's cool that they decided to leave it you know it's always yeah. been kind of a difficult place to live in um in the early 90s there was there was kind of a big battle going on i think they call it the walleye wars where uh, if you were staying at a at a U.S. resort, you weren't allowed to keep walleyes in from from Canadian waters, and it kind of singled mm -hmm. out very few areas. Uh, the angle, obviously, being the, probably the most walleye destination that that was affected, and um, 
So the angle actually has tried seceding from the United States uh, during that time. They wanted to become part of Canada. And th- it's been really difficult the last few years. Um, you know, the way the Canadian yeah. border works, they don't make exceptions for anything. Um, they don't want people finding loopholes through an exception. And so um, we've had to deal with all the same border regulations um, that the Canadians have had. And then to top it off, we're not Canadian citizens, so that makes it a little harder. We had to get tested. Luckily, um, they have made some exceptions, you know, in within uh, after about a year of border closure, they finally had come up with an exception for the Northwest Angle to let residents go back and forth, but still our clientele is having a hard time getting up. And, yeah, and even I now... You guys have the huge, uh, the huge ice road in the winter to kind of to still be able to get out there. That was crazy. 20, 22 miles only um, across Big Traverse. And then they went through the swamp up to the gravel road. That was, um, you know, the first year that they plowed it. Then this year, uh, they weren't able to use that swamp path that they took uh, the first time. And they, so they actually had 39 miles across Big Traverse. It only lasted about four days this season uh, before they closed it. Um, just blew in. Yeah, it'd oh, be they impossible. Couldn't, they couldn't keep it open this year. It was, you know, that that last year or the first year that they did it, pretty mild conditions and and um, actually so it was the best conditions I, I ever remember. Oh man, yeah, you could have you could have plowed it with a side by side or something. You know, it was besides the thin ice was the thing. They didn't open up the road until the second. Well, it was about January seventh was when they finally had safe enough ice, and even at that point. There were some good stretches where there was only like 10 inches because uh, the ice had blown apart as the lake was freezing. And, um, and you know, that ice road got a ton of press. I figured those guys that plow the road out of Kenora down to Windigo and stuff had to been just shaking their heads at all the press these guys were getting for 22 miles on the ice. They must plow, you know, 100 miles of ice road. Yeah, but, but these boys don't care about press <laughs> well no i know that you know. yeah i just i just like uh you know the type of of hardcore um outdoors men and like you got to be pretty damn committed to be plowing those roads it's not like they're checking their instagram for, <laughs> for <show> outs. <laughs> i'm sure it's the same on that end but yeah i mean it's, 22 miles but it's 22 miles of wide open so they earn that press yeah. yeah i mean this year i couldn't even keep 100 yard you know, road to my ice shack open. So I couldn't imagine even thinking about doing that. But after it blew shut, when they tried to reopen it, uh, they blew up both their plow trucks. Like they didn't even make it halfway across and, and everything. I mean, one of the trucks sat out there for a few weeks before they finally were able to get something to it to pull it off. But um, it was a real, that just crushed us at the angle, not, not having that, uh, that plowed road, um, you know, it was easier for clientele to cross than it was the first winter, but um, still that testing, you know, was really kind of uh, the killer for us. A lot of people were getting tested and they wouldn't get the results back within the time frame that they needed them. And mm-hmm. it was actually for my ice fishing, it was probably the slowest winter I've had since, um, you know, since I started working at the angle and, and that hurt. Uh, you know, the, the first year with all that press that the ice road got, we were actually very busy. We had about five or six weeks less ice season and we took the same number of ice fishermen out. I worked for an outfit, um, out of the angle. We got 40 fish houses and, Mm -hmm. uh, like eight, eight bombers and, um, they were going hard. I mean, every house was full every, every weekend and, um, to top it off, fishing was not good, uh, that, <laughs> that year. You couldn't and fish now, in Canada then though, right? What's that? You had to stay, did you have to stay on the U S line? Yeah. Like you had to stay on yep. the U S side. Yeah. I'm sure that had yep. something to do with it. Well, we, with those 40 fish houses, we stay on the U S side. Um, okay. I got, we you. aren't allowed to leave shacks in Ontario overnight when we're crossing the border. And so right. like, re- Red Fox ice fishing, all those shacks are stateside. And then I do, you know, snowmobile trips onto the Ontario side. But, um, but it was funny because we were so busy that year and fishing was not good. Now this year, uh, we didn't have nearly the amount of fishermen we normally would and, and fishing was good. And 
it wasn't just because there was less people out there. Like there was just a better group of fish that had moved up into the area we fish in. And, um, uh, it was too bad that we couldn't have had that the year that we were really grinding. Um, it was, you know, of course, I don't, I think a lot of guys don't realize how much harder we work on the ice when fishing is bad. <laughs> oh, dude. Yeah. I, anyone that says they want to guide in the winter, I just, I just say no, <laughs> just don't. You know, I mean, I, the, that's why you're kind of, you're unique because you still love it and you still grind at it. And every day it's just like, just, you know, to someone who's done it and seen the hardship and like how much equipment you break and, and how much work it is to see you still doing it is like, it's, it's wild and loving it. I don't know. Maybe it, you still seem to have the passion. For yeah, yet. absolutely. I, I, you know, I enjoy the winter out there. I really like the fact that I can get to uh, parts of the lake that are harder to reach for me in the summer. I can cruise up to Whitefish Bay. I do that just about, uh, you know, anytime I have a day off, I go look for lake trout and, and it's, mm -hmm. um, I, I enjoy riding too. And so, you know, um, that's just awesome to cruise across the lake, break and trail the whole way. We maybe put on a hundred miles in a day mm -hmm. and, um, and then you're catching some fish and just covering beautiful country. You know, I, I love going through that Alano Peninsula, uh, those old trapper trails through, um, the peninsula over to the other side is just a whole adventure on its own. So, um, yeah, bud. Lake, you ever go in there? Oh yeah. And yep. I sh I sh I'll I'll bleep out the name of the lake just because we're on <laughs> on a podcast. We don't want exposure. Um, it's not easy to get into, anyways. No, but. no. I I've got a good story about that actually. Uh, <laughs> a few years ago, um, well, you'd know Spencer. He he guided around the angle back in the day a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Um, so he's you know he's he's linked in with all these. Uh, like the Guggen guys and all that, like the super, the super online guys. So he said, Hey, let's go on a trip. And, and I said, okay, well, you know, I'll take you on a hell tour. We're, we're going to go to, to this lake and in the middle of a peninsula in the middle of a huge lake, like a, a crazy place. You know, I, I heard there's a trail here and here and uh, you know, this, this John B uh, like the King of the Guggens was, was there. He's a good dude, by the way. He's not real annoying like the other ones. <laughs> so he had just gotten a brand new snow machine, and its first ride was on this hell tour. Like, all it was was tag alders, popping over stumps. I, you know, I'm on a Skidoo Expedition wide track and absolutely destroying that. He's on this little, like, 550 thing, and it was just destroyed by the end of the trip. We caught, like, three walleye in there, and everyone's gear was broken so we couldn't even wait till the night bite so we just cut our losses and beat it out of there <laughs> <laughs> i remember that year was when there was that bad ice storm in the fall too so like every tree was laid over and it wasn't that year we it would have been impossible that yeah. day. It, it it must have been like the year before it was grown in but it wasn't like it did it, it, all the spruce trees weren't bowed over like we would have just turned around yeah I remember, I remember that because um, I think you guys tried taking that trail that goes through like the back end, right? We did, we did. So we need it. there used to be one there. Well, I haven't taken it for years, but the trail that goes right from um, Lake is the next one in between or something. The and more it's, it's, say, the more I have to edit them out. So just keep it. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's it's just. Um, uh, that first path on that one you guys took is all, sh you know, small spruce trees. And now I haven't taken that way in years. There's another one that goes, you know, to the north from the north end of the back of that bay. And, and that one's easier, but there's some guy in soon arrows that cuts those trails open. But yeah, they had, they had like cut it open. It was still a hell tour. Well, you know, when we went on that Manitoba trip a couple weeks ago, um, you know, the, the, I, I got this, well, I mean, there's, this is a whole huge story. I got this school bus that I converted into, you know, I put, I put the snowmobiles in the back and then, um, you know, well, I've heard about the, bus, bud. Huh? <laughs> the bus is an instant legend. We oh, get I call it the great white Buffalo. 
Yeah. So I, I'm not going to cut you off anymore when you're talking, boss. I'm just going to sit back and, and listen to this. Oh, it's, it's kind of something I've always wanted and always thought about. And this winter I found this bus, uh, it was a 2002 and, um, I got it for a thousand bucks and, uh, is not bad shape. I could, so anyways, I, I got this bus stuck in this guy's yard, like 5 AM in, uh, you know, Northern Manitoba. And, and he shows up the next morning because uh, he's got some security cameras that are going off all night when we're trying to get this bus out of his yard. And um, he goes, so what are you guys doing anyways? And, and I said, well, we're going to go back to this lake. And, and he, well, you're not getting into there. He goes, nobody's been in there all year and there's eight feet of snow. Well, you know, um, I was de- we were determined to get in there. And if I would have been the Alanu and I would have pulled up to that portage and and looked at what we were going to do. I said, no, it's impossible. I, I would have said, no way can we get in there, but I'm not going to drive all the way up there and not try. Well, we spent two days hacking through portages to, to get back into this lake, to not catch a fish. That was the worst part. But oh, man. Uh, I mean, the, the Alanu uh, definitely trained me for, for that trip that we went on. And, um, you know, I, I, it was just something else, I guess, just cutting the open portage trails that hadn't been opened all year. The snow was waist deep and man, I've, I've never shoveled myself out so much as I did that trip, but yeah, uh, I'd like to show, you know, when you get a guest with like, that shows up with 30, like super high end rods and like 20, <laughs> 20 tackle trays and all these bucket attachments on their snow machine. Like if you, if they went on one of those trips, like I keep all my ice tackle can fit in my chest pocket of my suit after going on those trips. Like, you know, how many, how many hell tours you've done where you don't even get a line wet. Oh, you break half the gear you bring with you. But I, guess I remember there was one time I took this guy had worked at the angle and, and I hadn't really fished with him before. He had never been through the Alanue. And, um, so, so we head out late season lake trout and he had his rods in a, backpack sticking up you know like this and and i said right away hey you want me to carry those on my my sled for you You know and he's nah you know and they're all brand new 200 dollar rods and i'm like oh geez and yeah we hadn't even got one mile in and they were all snapped off like right i mean it, it, he we got there he was using rods like this this long one eye left on them and and um i just i've gotten lucky i guess the, the thing that happens to me all the time is the line catches a branch and I'll spool out the whole reel without, without realizing it. I get to the other side and I grab my rod and, oh, you know, it, luckily I brought another one that hopefully didn't catch a branch. But, and then on the way yeah. home, the line will get wrapped up in my track, you know, and then I got to cut all the line out of the track on the way back. But, yeah. but anyways, well. yeah, I mean, I just... Uh, that that's all the things I just get a kick out of in the winter. And I just love going and doing that stuff. And, um, uh, yeah, especially now with like the, the new sonar that we have, um, you know, live scope and stuff like that has just made it like a, a whole nother reason for me to go out and, and try and cover stuff instead of having to drill 50 holes. Like I used to, I can, I can uh, drill one hole and figure stuff out. And I don't know. It's just the winter is something that is kind of like a love hate thing. I even bought this center console boat to try and get down to Florida in the winter. Some, and here I am like, haven't even brought it down there yet. So um, is that what you're guiding out of up here still? Yeah. Yeah. I I got a, it's a 24 foot Skeeter. Um, I got a great deal on it out of, uh, it was a dealer demo and, um, my original plan was to just kind of, you know, bring it down, um, to Florida, like late, late winter. I mean, end of March, beginning of April or something, go down there. And, and then of course with, uh, COVID and, and stuff like that this spring, then I I had to send it in for some warranty work and I didn't get it back till the end of April. And it's like, well, I don't know if I'm ever going to make it down there now, but I love guiding out of that boat anyways. It's, it's the ultimate boat for, uh, for this end of the lake. You know, it, it crashes those, those big traverse and little traverse waves, uh, no problem. And, uh, for musky fishing, being able to walk all the way around the, the outside of the boat is huge. You know, it's, 
Um, yeah. You're definitely setting yourself apart in that thing. You look like you're on Miami Vice ripping around in the traffic. <laughs> you can see it. You can see it from ten miles away. That's the worst part, you know. But, but yeah, yeah. It's, it's a it's an awesome rig. Uh, and honestly, if even if I um, don't ever pull it down to Florida, I think you know I'd get another one. Uh, I just love you know. I guess late season and early season when the temperature is cool is it's not ideal. Um, I think you'd be warmer in like a, in a 16 foot tinner or something. At least you can lay down in the bottom of it and get out of the wind. But, um, but yeah. It, anyways, yeah, it's, it's an awesome rig. I just love it. I've got it all set up now um, uh, with live scope kicking out every side of it and uh, things just efficient. How many, how many scopes you got on her? Well, I just got two. Only yeah. two, I guess, but um, it's... <laughs> yeah, you're like a damn microwave rolling down the bay. <laughs> <laughs> it's... Uh, you know, one thing about the center console is all that wiring has to come through one hole, uh, you know, down underneath the console. So um, I've got her maxed out as far as wires wires go. I think that there's probably about 10,000 zip ties and you open up the battery compartment and it's overwhelming, but... Yeah, you're one awesome. graph away from using conduit, external <laughs> mount conduit. I'm going to have to have, uh, like, high-rise wires and telephone poles in it pretty soon here. I mean, it's just – but it's a, it's an ultimate fishing machine. You know, that's what it is. And like I said, luckily at the angle, we get some hardcore clientele that is cool with, um, you know, putting on the layers and going out in the cold in the fall time. And, um, yeah. Yeah. It's a, that's it's a cool thing about the angle is it's like because it's so out there it kind of weeds out like it's the ultimate place to be a guide that that wants to like go hard you totally know, it's, not, it's not like a destination well i don't know maybe it is but it's not like you know where people are coming up and doing half days and just happy if they catch a fish and and no. you know, sitting on the beach the rest of the day it's like it seems like a hardcore fishing destination so absolutely absolutely it's like anglers things. it's anglers that come there and and like i said i rarely even have to provide any gear for anybody that comes up and um it it's makes it nice for me because i do like to go hard and uh sometimes it's kind of disappointing if you get somebody that isn't wanting to go hard with me especially if you get a good day of fishing or something but you know i've i've the biggest thing with guiding is being a good fisherman is not the most important part of being a, a good guide and i'm sure you know yeah, that. Not like, even close. no you got to know how to deal with people and and so um that's one thing i've gotten good at i think part of it was growing up around the resorts um on the rainy river there just always you know you're right in the middle of it and everything and and I just, yeah, you know, I, I realized, uh, this last few years, I was a little bit slower as far as client, as far as, uh, guiding clientele. And, and I, I had always wanted more time to fish with like friends and family. And I actually got that time finally the last few years. Well, it made me realize how much I really enjoy taking people out there that don't get to experience it every day, but want to, you know, that, so a lot of these guys, um, like you say, the angle is kind of an angler's destination. And um, these guys have been <clears throat> thinking about this trip for like 51 weeks. Since the day they left, they've been thinking about coming back. And, um, and that's really, uh, I realized that the last few years um, that I, you know, when I wasn't getting those people as often, I was... It, it's just uh part of guiding that I really enjoy, I guess. I don't know. So, yeah. Yeah. And I, I mean, I'm sure you've got, I, and I've had it before too. You've had clients over the years that it's kind of just turns into fishing with buddies. You know, if you see the same ones the same week every year, it's just kind of. Totally. You know, Most, I bet uh, like 80% of my clientele is uh return, you know, they'll book for next year when they leave and it, that makes it really nice because I know what to expect from them. They know what to expect from me. And uh, like you say, it just turns into a friendship except for um, I still got to get paid. So I don't try and get that good of friends with them. You know? <laughs> <laughs> no, but yeah, it's, yeah, I mean, 
it's it, it's awesome that uh, I get people coming back year after year, and I haven't been able to get a lot of them to come back that I had fished with for years before the border closure. Um, so I'm excited to start seeing them coming back. I think now things are starting to get a little easier for people to come up. Of course, now this year gas is expensive. I feel like that's keeping some people from booking, but um, yeah, yeah, they're throwing lots of curveballs coming your way, you know, and you have bodies up here at Crawford's camps and, and, uh, Indian head. And yeah, it's like, okay, finally you can open the doors and, oh yeah, we're just going to have the highest water level ever and record gas prices. Like just a oh. throat, a throat punch on, you know, on top of two years of misery. But, um, you know, you guys have proven I, you're, you're resilient and I'm sure it's going to come back around for you. Well, you know, the angle, uh, we had it slower with the border closure, but I really think the Northwest Ontario resorts got hit even harder than we did. You know, at the angle, we are year round, but, but a lot of the Northwest Ontario spots are only, you know, that camp only be open for like three or four months out of the year. So, um, I really was feeling for a lot of guys just North of me and, and, I think some guys have kind of packed up the guiding gig and, and, uh, you know, it's tough to make it. Uh, honestly, even this winter, I was starting to think, you know, getting, starting to scrounge pretty hard for paying the bills and everything. And it's like, man, am I going to have to rat? Cause it's hard to get back into it once you go get a job somewhere else and yeah, um, get a taste of the cushy life and, well, yeah, I mean, it's just uh, the angle is a tough place to live on its own. And then um, and then you got no work on top of it. And uh, I don't it's just tough. It's but we're getting through it. You know, I, I at the beginning of the whole thing, I said, hey, I'll be over. I'll, I'll still be here when we get back to normal. And yep. um, I'll admit there was a little bit where I was wondering if I was still going to be here. But I think things are, are you know rounding the corner a little bit so yeah bud good good to see you guys on the on the rebound it was uh yeah tough to watch oh yeah but your pastor now you got your van we got to dive back into that thing a little bit more because that white buffalo yeah i talked to sean mcgahee this spring <laughs> and he, was, he was telling me about this van you've been ripping around in and like you know parked it in seen arrows and we're catching a bunch of trout Parked and in the like, one night. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm like, how like how does this guy love fishing this much still where he's driving a van around <laughs> and just cracking them like daylight to dark? <laughs> you know, like it's it's, it's <laughs> awesome, man. It's like I said, I hadn't thought about it forever, and this thing popped up and and um, walk me through it a little bit, like the so, layout. The layout? Yeah. So, okay, so it was still a bus when I bought it. Still had it's a 72 passenger bus. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so it's like not big. <laughs> it's as big as they get, you know, and um uh it's I had just always thought about like how great it would be to be able to haul all the gear up with with it and then you you just stay right in it and um I I got it and I gutted all the seats out and I was trying to figure out a way that we can just open up the back end to put the sleds in. And, and I just kind of make it like a double door. You got the emergency door and then um, I just hacked off like that back corner. And so it, so it opens up like this, you drive them right in. I could probably fit like three or four sleds in it. And, um, and then uh, we just, once we get to wherever we're fishing, the sleds just park outside and I throw up kind of like a moving blanket thing. We stay right in it. It's awesome. It's, I don't know. It's, uh, it's kick ass. It, um, what are you heating it with? Well, I just got a little propane heater. Um, yeah. I didn't really start using it until pretty late this season. So it wasn't real cold, but they are already insulated. It's got okay. uh, insulation in the walls and ceiling. The floor is the only thing that's not insulated. Yeah. Um, so, you know, um, it actually heats pretty good. I could get rid of some windows. That would help. But um, the thing is a beast. It's got this gas engine in it, which isn't ideal But um, when, when it comes to the gas pump. But it, it's good for, like, troubleshooting if there is any issues. And 
I think uh, the the fuel mileage is like, I, I mean, it's single digits. It's not good. The, it's got a drinking problem, like a serious drinking problem. But um, yeah, How it's got a, an 8.1 liter V8 in it. So it's like 496 big block. The thing's yep. got power for days, and and um, I can't wait to throw some exhaust on it and really get it barking. But it's it's just a beast, man. I pull up to the border with it, and and the agents just look at me like you're getting you know, searched. <laughs> well, that's that's the <laughs> craziest off the thing, side, sir. <laughs> that's the craziest. So I stayed I stayed in the bus for like two weeks in Manitoba, and. Um, you know, when, when I left, uh, when we were on our way home, I realized I had lost my phone. So I like tore the whole bus apart looking for it. I dropped my buddy off in Winnipeg and, um, and I'm heading for the border. By the time I get there, it's like 3.30 a.m. I look like I'm homeless. You know, I've been just, I'm just greasy and like, <laughs> and the bus stinks. It's like a locker room. And, and to top it off, everything is just, you know, I, I like all my suitcases and stuff. I just... <laughs> I just ripped everything apart. And um, so the bus is just a mess. And I'm thinking, man, these guys are going to tear me apart. And yep. um, I pull up and he goes, where are you coming from? And I said, North Steep Rock Lake. And he, he just goes, you bringing anything in from Canada? I said, nope. He said, have a good night. And I, could, I barely even slowed down. I couldn't believe it. I, I went straight and bought a lottery ticket. Um, right after that but i figured i must have already used all my luck up because i didn't yeah. but yeah i mean <laughs> i couldn't believe it but no it's it's something else and uh like uh the border the border agents just love it you know i pull up and uh they're, they're just the, everybody comes out and and well just comes in to check it out they're not even searching me they're just so you know so you put your sleds right in the back of this thing huh and i'm like yep and they're like sweet and i'm like <laughs> <laughs> but uh it is I, never have any salt on your rig oh it's perfect yeah if anything breaks you pull it in thaw it out and um and then you can just stay in, uh, in and on top of it the first trip we made in it while well, well the first trip i stayed at sean's place yeah and um going down the angle road it was just relentless washboard i had brake lines snapping off and uh <laughs> Um, I had to just make one trip to figure out what was going to break. Well, then the next trip, we went to Sioux Narrows. It was that April blizzard. They got like 16 inches of snow, and and I'm I'm thinking that I'm going to be in a way of the plow truck in the morning. So we yeah. get off the ice, and, and I'm trying to move it around a little bit, end up sliding off the road. You know, I'm going up a pretty good hill, slides backwards off into the ditch, and it's like 10 p.m. now, and, you know, nobody's going to help me. I, I knew that I was going to need to call a tow truck. We ended up sleeping in the bus at like a 40-degree angle, you know. My girlfriend cracks open a beer and sets it down. It just dumps over and rolls to the back of the bus. And, and uh, you know, the next morning, I don't think the tow truck got there till like noon. And I think just about every single person in Suneros had done a slow drive-by. And I'm just, you know, we're... We're trying yeah, to small town, <laughs> but, um, uh, you know, after those trips, I mean, it's always, every time I've taken it somewhere, there's, there's been something that, uh, you know, we get to, we get to steep rock Lake and then I try and turn around in this driveway and, uh, they got, they actually sent us some of their security footage from the front door um you know of us trying to get this bus out of their driveway and and uh it was a riot man it's and and there's actually a lot of people that that will buy school buses and make them into like an rv and uh they call them schoolies and it's got kind of like a a following you know you find a lot of youtubers that that's a thing then i could have a channel on youtube just with the bus much less the fishing and all this other stuff You've got the um, first fishing bus for sure. Well, the first one I've heard of. Oh, it's sweet. It's yeah. There's. I can't wait to uh, for next winter actually just for that bus uh, to take that thing around and and keep hitting lakes with it. Try not piss yeah. anybody off, but yeah. I mean, you're not going to hide real well. <laughs> it sticks <laughs> out. The world's going to know where you're fishing. Like I, I knew I knew you're fishing in whitefish. <laughs> the first day you made her. 
<laughs> it's something else, man. I uh, I want to get another one now. And you know what? Buses are cheap. That's the thing. I want to get a whole team of buses. We'll go all the way up to Reindeer or something, right? Like, go somewhere where there is no place to stay, and that's what makes it worth it. Yeah, you know, haul gear up and stay in it, and and um, uh, you know, if it breaks down up there, then I got a cabin on Reindeer Lake. That's perfect. I'll just leave her there. <laughs> <laughs> but, I didn't look at it from that angle, but yeah, I guess you could just throw her on blocks and throw a wood stove in the corner. And that into the wild movie, that kid lived in a bus. Yeah, it didn't work out real great for him, but he made he made a go of her for a while. When the engine and tranny goes out on it, I'm just gonna put skids on it and pull it out on the ice, and then we'll have like a a big ice shack out there. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that would fill up. There yeah. was a guy that put, parked a limo on uh, on Rainy River this winter and was renting it out. Did you see that? No, I missed that. Yeah, he had like an old prom limo and it had holes in the floor. Dude, that's... I, I talked very about reasonable putting holes too. In, the, in the bus floor. It'd be like the world's biggest snow bear. Yeah, I'm surprised there's not already holes in it, to be honest. I figured that'd be the first thing you'd do. There's a couple holes in it, but they're just rust holes right now. I haven't... I haven't got any cut into it yet, but oh, I'd like to see that first. limo. I have to hunt that down. You know, I, I drove a limo down here in high school uh, to give people rides home from the bar just to yeah. kind of uh, keep from drunk drivers on the road and stuff. And nice. um, the thing was, was legendary. I took that one through the border too, bringing people home at 3 a.m. You know, this Cadillac limo, shag carpet and people jammed in the back and you know, I, I got to wake them up to figure out where I'm bringing them. And that was, that was a whole nother story, but. What's your daily driver, a Hearst? Seems like you <laughs> like long vehicles. <laughs> oh gosh. Yeah. Well, right now my daily driver is the boat, I guess. I'd, uh, yeah. And that's was... another super long too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And all your, yeah. I mean, you're definitely setting yourself apart on the, on the vehicle front. You've got a normal <laughs> snowmobile. Yeah. Yeah. For, for the most part, you know, it's, uh, I guess, I guess sometimes that thing is looking a little goofy too. This winter I had a, a boat seat that I had rigged up on the front bumper so I could just pull up and, and sit down right on my, on the front of the sled and fish, you know? And so that had kind of a funny look to it too, I guess. It must just be my thing. Yeah. They took that off for the Polaris <laughs> video you did. <laughs> yeah yeah it's I, not a factory option <laughs> oh, it was, I, I told him it could be an accessory you know that's it'd be perfect maybe a bench seat even <laughs> <laughs> yeah you wouldn't be getting into the elno lakes with that thing on <laughs> i could strap somebody on the front and be like an adventure tour <laughs> Yeah, I'll, I'll be first in line for that. <laughs> Hit all the sticks. Yeah. Oh, well, man. when I get the bus up there next winter, I'll have to. I'll give you a shout. And we'll we'll go uh, hit some ditches with it. Yeah, bud. I got to <laughs> see the thing in action. I can't wait. <laughs> it, it's, I, it's funny. I didn't that realize it was know. like a mega bus. I thought it was like a fourteen passenger thing, or I didn't realize it was a mega rig. It's as big as they get. I think it's like forty feet long or something. I don't even know, but bright, bright yellow. Well, no, be in Minnesota, uh, it can't be yellow if it's not for school. So it's all white. Okay. Uh, white. It looks like a prison bus. It's white with black stripes. So nice. Uh, I, I call it the Great White Buffalo, and uh, uh, it's unique, man. I I just. Uh, it, it just got started on it you know i only i only yeah. really uh tore it apart probably for a few weeks before i started using it so i plan next fall during freeze up i'm really gonna get her decked out so can you fit it in the shop it looks like you have great big doors behind you well yeah this isn't this isn't my shop this is uh the marina the lake of the woods marine luckily uh, i'm good friends and and have always done business with these guys and um yeah. Um, uh, I actually can pull the bus right in here to work on it. So that's key. There isn't many shops that it fits in. So new, no. <laughs> it's not fitting in a 24 by 24 residential garage. <laughs> well, it's kind of a rolling storage unit too. You know, I got all my ice fishing gear in there and, uh, um, yeah. 
uh it's perfect so i plan on maybe using it for hunting season next year and um it's something else maybe maybe you'll see it at kbi i'll throw a hitch on it and and pull the uh boat up with it yeah well you, you'd really have to make the tent ride if you're towing your boat with a bus oh you can yes it through the tent. yes well, i they, didn't even think they, about that they would need a wider tent but you can make her work you could hold a bass like out of each window or you get creative with it or put the boat yeah. inside of the bus i'll fill i'll fill the bus with water and i'll have the fish we can just hold them up to the window from the inside yeah i mean the possibilities are endless <laughs> Are you uh, are you fishing any derbies this year? Yeah, um, plan on fishing KBI. We've been dying to get back up there. Um, yeah, you, know, yeah, you guys got this year. You came. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, we awesome. had talked about it. We had talked about it for a long time, and it's just kind of as a guide, it is kind of tough to um, give up the, a paycheck from guiding to. Really tough, but you know, um, my good friend Dave Winters. Uh, He's, he's just, um, you know, he's, his dream has been to, you know, compete in KBI since his first year guiding it. And, um, and it just like, we couldn't, we couldn't not do it anymore. Uh, you know, just seeing, seeing people go through the tent with their fish and everything. And then to be able to do it our first year there, man, yeah. uh, it was something else. It just like. Uh, I, I, I always thought that we would have a good chance at being able to go through the tent, but then to, to come up there and do it our first year was just like, um, surreal. I mean, and you can, you, you know, Dave and I are, are best friends, but we're very different. And, um, I, I look back on some of those shots from when we got to go through the tent and, you know, uh, Dave's, Dave's just he, he's looking out at the people in front of him and he sees every single set of eyes looking at him. And, and I look out and I'm not seeing anybody, you know, I just, I'm, and, uh, it's, it's I, like, as you know, it's just, uh, something else. And to be able to do it like that was so much fun. And man, we were on some good fish that year. And, and, uh, I just, I think about that year all the time, just the, the conditions, the haze that was in the air and, uh, the glass water all three days. And, yeah. um, it's so know, awesome that there's like something like that to look forward to. Cause it's, I mean, it's a pretty, if you look at the map, it's a pretty random place to have a mega tournament and, and, totally. and a lot of locals like, and people that fish it don't realize like, it's not normal to have a 140 or 150 boat three day uh thirty thousand dollar first place tournament like it's it's really like the you know the, people say it's the biggest tournament around here well it's it's the biggest tournament in canada and it's probably the biggest open team tournament like you know uh, from there's nothing like that sturgeon bay open is is in the midwest and other other than that it doesn't exist so to to and have I, and or just, to it's just an angler's dream and then the lake that it's on too. I mean, it's, it's an amazing yeah. tournament to be a part of. And then to have it, um, you know, on Lake of the Woods is just like, it makes it so off. Oh, gosh. Yeah. Like it's just an incredible thing. I'm really excited to be able to get back up there and, and try and, and try and do that again. You know, last year the border opened like the Monday after the Derby, mm -hmm. uh, which was right. hard, <laughs> but, um, yeah, you know, and and it's just like uh, being able to go to wherever you want. You know, that first year we did it, we only saw like one other derby boat all three days, and um, uh, it's just like uh, you, you start to wonder, like, where just you know, I don't know, how did we end up like in that location here? And it's just the the way things kind of fall into place. I, you know how it is, like. It, it just, um, it's crazy how all that happens. And, and then, uh, like I said, it was our dream to be able to maybe someday be able to go through the tent and then all, all of a sudden we're, we're, we're in it. And, and, um, you know, it's, uh, I, I hope that we get to be in there again someday. So it's, yeah, but it's that's just, the goal and it's, it's not a real easy thing to do either. 
I mean, no, <laughs> you no. know, as well as anyone, it's not. So, I mean, just, just making it in there is like, you know, it sounds silly. I want to make the tent so I can get towed through a tent in front of people and throw up Frisbees while well, it's like, it's dead. It's, you know, it's awesome. It's like, it's the so top, much more than that because it's the it experience you're ever going to get like for competitive events. It's just, there's, yeah, there's nothing else like it. And it, and then to be able to like, love this lake like I do and and like my my buddy Dave does and just live for Lake of the Woods and then I feel like KBI is kind of like the ah, gosh like it is the ultimate for Lake of the Woods anglers like um, that's like the culmination of your your spring and summer too yeah like you're thinking about it the whole time oh man it's yeah it's something else we were I actually was just talking to Dave today about it so it's it's something that every single day I feel like it comes up at some point you know you got to talk it's just is always there and 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 like I said I'd love to fish more derbies um I just don't it's it's when you're a guide uh it's tough to do that I don't want to um let down the clientele that like I've talked about I've fished with for years too um yeah you know, I, I, I got to be there for them and uh, because they're looking forward to coming up to Lake of the Woods to, to come fishing with me, just like how I'm looking forward to KBI. And, and so, yeah, yeah. Um, well, if you're only going to fish one, then that's definitely the one to do. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so you, got absolutely. Her, you got her figured out there. Um, I always I always enjoy that musky tournament in Nestor, too. You know, it's kind of like an end of the season party. There's a lot of other guides there that I see on the lake throughout the season. And yeah. um, by that time, the season has started to, you know, wind down, starting to wind down a little bit. And so it's it's easier for me to give up some guide days at that time, you know, to go do that that tournament, which, of course, is a lot smaller. You know, it's 30, 35 teams most years, but. <laughs> and it's just the the people that are there, you know, I've, well, uh, the same year that we did well at KBI, we ended up winning the Muskie cup. And, um, and so yeah. we've, we've been able to hoist the cup and we've also not caught a single fish and I have just as much fun either way. Like I just love going there and, and getting to see everybody and, you know, I drinking whiskey and talking one. muskies. Yeah. And I mean, I, even though it's less boats, I bet you'd, guy you know people that that's their only tournament talk about it like we talk about kbi like it's it's and especially the time of year like it's the culmination of the summer and there's i mean really some of the best musk musky anglers in the whole area are in it and you, you know you all have like yeah. minds and well and that it's, that it's trophy cool it's got to be one of the most epic trophies in fishing you know that musky cup is just uh like how cool is that thing it's, was that a, uh, like the blosser that made it or who made that thing? I don't know who made it. It says it on the bottom. I'm pretty sure Byron and, um, and Terry Brennan. Okay. Shout out made it. Byron and Terry. Cause yeah. Yeah, like, for those listening and who haven't seen the musky cup, it's, uh, it's pretty much a Stanley cup made of, what is it? White pine. Yeah. And it's just one chunk that they've carved out. It probably weighs 40 pounds and, yeah. uh, you get your name burnt into it when you win. You get to hold on to it until the next year, and um, and it's just so cool. It's it's like a um, when when we got to hang on to it for that year, I brought it all over the place with. I brought it to the bar and Bidet here, and it <laughs> fell off a stool, and um, and I broke a big chunk off the top of it, you know, and it was devastating. I was I went straight home. I just was like couldn't believe that um that we had broke the cup you know and yeah and I, you gotta get was, home and start whittling a replica <laughs> well <laughs> my my partner stevie ended up repairing it and he did such a good job that if we wouldn't have told anybody when we brought it back i don't think anybody would have even noticed and um you know i think if it would have happened anywhere but in a bar i probably would have caught some flack for it but the fact yeah. that you know, we were half in the bag and, and, uh, just having a good time with it. Um, yeah. You etched out your plate, your, uh, etched out your story on the cup. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and then, and then that next year we brought it back, we almost got it again. And, and like I said, it's just, 
Like uh, we ended up uh, getting second place by one inch that next year. And, and yeah. it's almost like that cup is a bit of a curse because uh, nobody's been able to put their name on it twice. Yeah. And, um, and it's, uh, it's kind of just a, it's a cool thing, man. And I, I, I can't wait. That's another thing that I am just looking forward to all year. And, um, it, it's the derbies are fun, but guiding is, uh, yeah, for sure. Paycheck, you know? So, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, you're on the lake either way. So obviously yeah. that's, that's the goal for you. It's obviously born India and uh, I love it. I don't know that I've met anyone that loves this lake, you know, as, as much as you, obviously. So I, I, man, that's, that's a, a huge compliment to me. Like I, I do love it. I live for this lake and I've sacrificed a lot to be able to go out there and do what I do every day. And, um, man, I, I feel so lucky that, uh, I've been able to kind of make a name for myself doing it because, um, I guess, you know, it's, it's not an easy, it's not an easy game to be in. Um, the guiding, no. game, especially for a guy like me, kind of, um, you know, it, uh, it's not like I had it made or anything like that. You know, I've been kind of scratching to get out of the hole that I put myself in when I started guiding. And, uh, you know, it, it's, I ha I fish with a lot of very successful guys that, kind of say well joe you know just keep doing what you're doing and and i kind of say well it's easy for you to say you know you got you you got money and everything you got a house to live in well you know i i i've always said well i can't fish out of a house but i can sleep in my <laughs> boat so uh <laughs> i guess i just gotta pick what i'm what I, now i got a bus at least so <laughs> yeah no, you'll, you'll be good to go man it's working it's, out uh, I'm sure there's lots of people that look at you and say like, yeah, you know, that, that have envy coming the other way too. So it's, it's awesome. I, I just, um, I love it. And, and, um, I don't know what else to say about it other than that. Like, it's not just the fishing. It's not just the people. It's not just the lake, but, um, all those things together, like, I just can't imagine doing anything else. So it's, it's, it's a special place. Definitely. Well, I mean, we could go on forever. Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I kind of I don't like even know what we stuff. talked about. We talked about a bus, and uh, yeah, I mean, we just barely scratched the surface, but we're at like an hour and fifteen. <laughs> um, <laughs> we're probably gonna have to fire fire another one up. I'm I'm sure whoever's listening to this is gonna, you know, get a kick out of your stories, and um, that's cool, man. Yeah. I'd love to do it again. It's funny. I kind of had an idea of some things I wanted to talk about and I don't know if I talked about any of them, but it's like, I, <laughs> I, I definitely, um, it, it, this is cool. So hopefully some yeah, people dude. can enjoy it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure they will. And, uh, before you hop off, I don't know if you need any more clients and maybe you won't get any through here, but, uh, <laughs> drop, drop us your info and, and, you know, give yourself pump your tires a little bit here while we uh while we log off yeah i just uh um you know i live and guide at the northwest angle you can get a hold of me um uh my my email is joe cooper 89 at gmail.com um i got a website joe cooper lotw.com i think it's still up i don't know but yeah it's um, up. I, I creeped you i i uh probably got some updating to do on there but we'll link that below and uh you cool. obviously do all the species but you're you're kind of a musky specialist right i do yep yep I, that's um probably 80 90 percent of my clientele is musky fishing um once the season gets started but uh the walleyes and crappies and everything are kind of where the bread and butter is at as far as guiding goes so any resort out of the angle I'll, I'll fish at and, or, or even the South shore, if it works out, um, war out or bidet, but, um, yeah, most bud, just, uh, just stay out of seen arrows when you're guiding. Hey, <laughs> the, the boys need a piece of the pie too. <laughs> you keep it self land. We'll, uh, we'll link your stuff below and, uh, hopefully I run India before KBI, but if not have, uh, have a good safe season and we'll keep in touch, buddy. Thanks a bunch, man. I appreciate it. Thanks we'll for taking time. I know you're busy, so.
get back to her. Appreciate it, man. Okay, well, that was Joe Cooper. Uh, dude's got endless stories. We could have gone on all night. Uh, you know, lots of good laughs. Definitely uh, a good guy to talk to, and you know, as passionate as they as they come about Lake of the Woods and and about fishing. So pretty cool to have him on. I uh, just wanted to give a shout out over here to uh, Manitoba Bass Anglers, uh, Ben Lang, Trish, um, Mike Miles. I mean, there's a bunch of people involved that I'm missing, but they, uh, you know, they had to deal with a lot um, setting up this Falcon Lake tournament and having to, you know, deal with all the community pressure and and angler pressure and and everything that comes along with that. So we're really lucky to have uh, you know people like that in the area um you know that are that are out there growing the sport and and you know spending their own time doing doing a lot of this thankless work so um thanks guys just wanted to give them a shout out they're uh heading to lac de bonnie this coming weekend this will be released on a thursday so it'll be it'll be like that saturday there's a there's a tournament there it'll be some big weights i'm sure and then uh we're into kind of walleye tournament time um I've been eyeballing the the Dryden Walleye Masters. I don't have any time to practice, and I haven't fished walleye there for probably six or seven years. But might just throw my name in the hat and and show up and go fishing for the two day tournament. So starting to think about walleye stuff. Uh, we'll touch on a little bit of that next time. We'll uh, we'll see how it goes. But anyway, thanks again for listening. Uh, subscribe if you're watching on YouTube. Comment something to uh, trip up the algorithm a little bit. Um, if you're watching on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, reviews are, I guess, the deal on there. So review and rating and and do all that stuff. Subscribe, tell your friends, whatever. And uh, yeah, have a good weekend, everyone. Thanks for watching. Be safe out there.